Welcome to the award-winning Superhuman Academy podcast, where we interview extraordinary people to give you the skills and strategies to overcome the impossible. And now, here's your host, Jonathan Levy. Before we get started, I want to take a moment to talk to you guys about personal development. You see, if I've learned anything over the last five years of hosting this show, it's that the journey of self-improvement never ends. There's always a way to improve and grow. That's why my team and I have recently launched Superhuman Squad, an all-access pass to our full library of personal development courses. Think of it as the Netflix of personal development. For just $49 a month, you get access to each and every one of our premium courses, which sell for as much as $399 each. Best of all, you'll be the first to gain access to our new courses, courses that we're developing in partnership with some of the most esteemed thought leaders we've ever hosted on the show. To get started, simply visit superhumanacademy.com. Greetings, super friends, and welcome to this week's episode where we are joined by Kathleen Trotter. She is a fitness expert, media personality, personal trainer, writer, life coach, and Pilates and ELDOA instructor. And overall, she is a health enthusiast. She's written two books on finding your fit and figuring out what works for you when it comes to fitness and nutrition. And so I wanted to have Kathleen on the show just to talk about the ways that we find motivation, the ways that we choose what is right for us out of all the million different things recommended on this podcast, and how she is helping clients achieve their optimal fitness. It was a really enjoyable conversation, and I think you are going to love listening to it. So without any further ado, Kathleen Trotter. Kathleen, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm great. The sun is shining. I'm in a good mood. I just did my run. I got sort of halfway through my morning routine, so I feel like I'm half a human being. But this podcast was early, so I'll do the second half later. (laughs) I love it, and I appreciate you making uh, concessions for us. What is your morning routine? I'm curious. Well, it's evolving, um, which is definitely one of my philosophies with health and wellness is that everything should evolve. And, you know, the healthy lifestyle that you have now is going to hopefully be different than in your, you know, 40s, 50s, 60s. I'm definitely different than when I'm in my 20s. So, you know, if you'd met me a year ago, I would have been like, I'm not the type of person who does yoga. I'm not the type of person who meditates. And I even did a, a breakfast television segment that was called Yoga's Not My Jam. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's how much I was like against it. And then, I don't know, through therapy and I'm a big believer in therapy and, you know, all the reading I do and all the podcasts I listen to, I was like, you know, sometimes when you say you're not the type of person who does X, that's exactly what you need to explore. So I decided to sort of start to explore that kind of thing. So I'm, I'm a runner for sure. I did... Ironmans and marathons in my 20s and now it's my 30s and I still run and I still bike and I still I love Pilates but I make sure that after my run I actually do a little bit of yoga and I do a little bit of meditation even if it's just like five or ten minutes and I journal so I'm like a whole new woman like honestly in my 20s you would have asked me what I did and I'd be like I did a four-hour bike ride and then I did weights and and now I'm, I'm trying to be a little bit more chill and enjoy the moment just slightly more. I love that. I definitely feel the same way that as I've gotten more mature, I have relaxed and been more compassionate with myself. Yeah, I love the Kristen Neff book, Self-Compassion. That really made a big dent in my philosophy with myself. And I think more than that, you know, so I'm with my partner, James, we've been together for about 20 years and, you know, he's so supportive of everything I do, but often I will do something like, you know, I'll do a marathon or I would have done an Ironman or, or whatever. And he would just look at me like, Oh my God, you're amazing. And I'd be like, well, no, I'm 30 seconds slower than I should have been. And I'm this and I'm that, or I'd finish a course and, you know, I'd be like, well, that was good, but I could have done better. And he just always sort of looks at me like, well, then why are you doing any of it? if you're not enjoying any of it. So I'm trying very hard to enjoy more. And I don't know, I remember I was listening to a podcast 
I don't, I honestly don't remember. I think it was on the other F word podcast, but I, I don't remember exactly. And the host was saying something like, well, I just try to teach my kids that you should always do your best. And the person doing the interview, you could tell she was hesitating on if she should correct the host or not. And then eventually she stepped in and she said, you know, everybody says that, but I'm just going to push back a bit and say, if you do your best at everything, if your kids do their best at everything, they will end up in the hospital. Like you can't do your best at everything everything. Life is about deciding what in that moment, in that year is going to be the thing that you're going to put all your passion into and and then go from there and understand that like we can sort of do anything, but not everything. And and you if you try to do everything at 100%, you kill yourself, you know? So I'm working on that as well, because I think for a lot of years, I tried to be you know, the best partner and the best daughter and the best business owner and the best Ironman triathlete. And then, you know, eventually you're like, well, you have to sort of pick your battles a little bit. Yeah, exactly. Find your unique ability and, and serve it. Kathleen, I realized we skipped over your bio because we got straight into your morning routine. Tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do. And then I want to know, how did you get into it? What happened that made you so passionate about this? Okay. Well, I think you can tell from the first five minutes that I'm not good at just answering a straight question. So I think if James, my partner was saying who I was, he would say somebody that never, ever, ever answers the question given. I just sort of take it on my own little tangent, but I am a personal trainer. I'm a life coach. I'm a nutritionist. I'm an avid mover and exerciser. I'm sort of a recovering perfectionist a little bit of a workaholic, but I love my work. I love my working with my, my clients. And I think it's hard when you're, you know, self-employed that line between work and life, it's very blurry because everything I do, I enjoy. I'm hopefully a really good, you know, partner to James and, and daughter to my mother. But really what I try to be is just a positive, you know, force to the world, a force that teaches people or helps model to people that being active can be something that's empowering and energizing versus shaming and overwhelming. And, and I think that coming from the background that I do, which is I was a really unhealthy, unhappy child, well, teenager. And I think that that's one of the reasons why I turned into that sort of perfectionist driven, have to do everything perfectly, because I was so worried about falling back into my old pattern. So I'm 36. And the first half of my life, I spent pretty much hating myself and my body. I'm like six feet tall, which I now love. But you know, when I was a kid, I was taller than all the boys and I was awkward. I was overweight. I ate my way through my parents' divorce. I just was, you know, I snuck food. I was so full of shame. I was telling one of my clients the other day, this story of, I used to go into Subway, which is like a, a sandwich store in Canada. I don't know if you guys have that, but, mm -hmm. and I would want a 12 inch meatball sub with cheese. But I was embarrassed to order that because I was kind of fat and I didn't want the person behind the counter to judge me. Now, the person couldn't care at all what I ordered. Like, he just wanted me to pay my bill. But I would go in and I'd make up this whole story of like... Oh, I'm buying the 12 inch, but really I'm just going to eat the six inch and the other six inches for my friend. And I'm going to take some of the cheese off, but she wants the cheese. And like, so I grew up, you know, extremely ashamed of who I was and I hated being active. And so that all sort of changed. Um, when my mom said to me, listen, Kathleen, we have to find a way for you to be active and you have to find a way that works for you, but being active has to be thought of as a non-negotiable. And that was actually the sort of nascent of, of the, the philosophy for my first book. So I've written two books and the first one is Finding Your Fit. And it really comes from my process of my mom just saying, listen, you've always been better with adults than you have with people your own age. So we're going to get you a membership at the YMCA because most people at the Y are either under five and in swimming lessons or mm -hmm. kind of over 50, right? And she's just like, you're just going to go walk on the treadmill. And I did. And that sort of, you make fitness a non-negotiable, but how you do fitness is up to you. And something is always better than nothing is a huge tenet of that book. It, it is, it's about finding your fit. It doesn't matter what, you know, your brother or your sister or your favorite celebrity does. It's about figuring out how to thrive in, in your own lane. So I really credit my mom, both for helping motivate me to, uh, to move and helping me find a solution and helping to teach me how to do me and be me. And from that experience, everything, you know, that got the ball rolling. So I started walking at the Y and then I started doing some weights and then I started taking some aerobics classes. And eventually I took so many aerobics classes that the person who ran the Y was like, you should teach this. <laughs> so 
I started teaching some classes and then I always thought I was going to be a lawyer, but I was really enjoying teaching fitness classes. So I was like, well, maybe I'll do kinesiology in my undergrad because you can kind of do anything you want in your undergrad and then do law school later. So I got my personal training certificate and I used doing personal training to help me get myself through university. And it just sort of spiraled from there. And then I did that. And then I finished university and I was like, I don't want to be a lawyer yet. Like I'll do that next year. So I got my Pilates certification And then eventually I went to my mom and I said, like, I know, mom, you want me to be something, I don't know, big or something secure. Like my mom was an actress and a single mom and we didn't have a lot of money and she'd always wanted something really secure for me, something like being a lawyer, something real. And I put kind of real in quotes. In hindsight, I understand that that was just her wanting to protect me and that what I do now is very real. But at the time, I felt very much like I was letting my mom down. And I said to her, I was like, you know, I just I can't do it. It's not me. I don't want to work for anybody else. And I love this. And so that's when we kind of came up with the compromise that I'd go and do a master's in exercise science because she said, like, fine, but I want you to have education and I want you to keep going. And so, yeah, so that's me. That's a really, really long winded me. I love it. The biography part is one of the most interesting parts of all of this. Yeah. It's fascinating where it starts. Yeah. Now I have a question, which is, I think you're probably the first physical activity coach meets life coach person I've spoken to. So I want to ask you about motivation because you come at this from both different angles. And I mean, obviously your motivation comes from knowing what happens with your body and your self-esteem when you're not active. But how can people listening motivate themselves. And when I say people listening, I'm including myself because I'm supposed to do, you know, a CrossFit workout four times a week. And actually I make it two or three times a week and, and I'm definitely far from perfect. And I sense that there's a lot of people out there who are that way. It's what they actually want to do in theory and what they do in practice is very different. Yeah. I can't tell you how much I love that question. So before I actually answer that question, I'm going to back up a little bit. You'll see I do this a lot. One of the things that I think is really missing in the fitness world is this focus on your inner dialogue or your mindset that allows you to connect the dots between wanting and doing. So one of the reasons I wrote both of my books is because when I go to the, you know, Indigo or whatever, and I look at fitness books, they're all about the knowledge, right? It's like, do this lunge, go to CrossFit, do this workout, eat these foods. And knowledge is great, but knowledge is only half of the puzzle. It's the first bit, but you then need to be able to follow through. So I always thought that it was really interesting that there's all these self-help books that teach you, you know, how to talk to yourself and how to follow through and how to make yourself do something, but they don't really tell you what to do. And then there's all these fitness books that say like, do this, do this, but they don't meld the two together. So I really wanted my work, all of my work from the writing that I do on my website to my books to meld the knowledge that I have from life coaching and that, as you said, that sort of motivational piece with the knowledge piece. Because if you think, you know, one of my favorite quotes is a Derek Sivers quote, which is, if knowledge was enough, we'd all have six packs and be billionaires, right? Like we all mostly know what to do, you know, eat more vegetables, drink more water, move a little bit more. But knowing and doing are so very, very different things. And the creator of uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, I forget his first name, but Fordyth is his last name. He has that famous quote that knowledge is to action like spaghetti to a brick, right? Like they don't have necessarily anything to do with each other unless you can figure out how to put the two together, right? So I'm a really big believer in follow through. And I think what's interesting about follow through is it's actually the opposite of motivation, I think a lot of people think and talk about motivation and it's going at it the wrong way because we all have motivation when we're feeling really good, but that's not when you need it. Like I'll give you an example with myself. I love these fudge bars. They're like a ice cream bar that are sold at Loblaws. And, um, when I go to the grocery store, I'm like, Oh, I can buy those. You know, I'll just have one a week and it's fine. But I know that when I, it's 11 o'clock at night and I'm tired and I've worked a full day of clients, I'm not going to have the motivation to resist those fudge bars. Like I can resist them, you know, when I'm not tired and not angry and not sad and all that stuff. So instead of motivation, I'm a really big believer in setting up systems to set yourself up for your future, lesser, more tired, more angry self. And those systems can include knowing the self-talk that's going to help you 
walk yourself off that ledge. It's also systems like I keep the fudge bars at my mom's house so I can still have them because I believe in living life. But if I want one, I go over to her house and I have one of them. And, you know, I have a visit and, you know, she's like 10 minutes away. I get a little bit of a walk and then I come home. So systems don't have to be physical systems, although they can be like controlling your environment. You know, they can be knowing if you're going to a party to offer to bring a healthy option. So you at least know you have something to eat when you get there, right? It's maybe your system is that you sleep in your exercise clothes. So when you wake up, you're more likely to go to CrossFit. Like, so if I know, for example, for me this morning, as I said, I knew I was only going to be able to get half of my morning routine done, which I knew I wanted to get a run done and then at least my yoga. And then I could do my meditation and journaling after, but I slept in my exercise clothes because I knew that it was going to be early and I would have all of the excuses in the world when I rolled over in bed and wanted to keep sleeping. But I slept in my exercise clothes and I have self-talk that I know really works for me, which is you always feel better when you move, project yourself into the future, your future self is going to feel better if you move. And when it comes to being in bed, I say, listen, I can sleep for half an hour more and wake up and feel just as tired because no matter when I get up, I kind of feel that like, oh, I don't want to get out of bed feeling bed is so nice. Or you can just get your ass out of bed now and your future self will be more energized for your podcast. That's a good one. I like that. Yeah. So it's a long winded way of saying that I think that instead of looking for motivation, look to understand why you do things. I call it setting yourself up for success and turning wishes into goals, right? I think with health and fitness, most of us have wishes like, okay, I want to be healthier. I want to eat better, but we don't take the time to figure out what does that mean? How do I have healthy food prepared in the fridge that I can easily assemble for, you know, a healthy meal in 10 minutes? So it takes as long to assemble something healthy as it does to assemble like a microwave pizza, right? So, so much of it is just having that healthy food prepared and knowing what your triggers are going to be. A lot of people have a lot of social triggers, like as in, you know, they go to a party and they want to eat a lot. I'm the opposite. I don't like eating at parties because I don't like food getting like stuck in my teeth. I'm much more likely overeat if I'm watching TV because I wasn't allowed TV when I was a kid. So eating in front of the TV is very decadent for me. So then I have to be very careful with that. Like, so I have things that keep my hands busy when I'm, when I'm watching TV. So I don't constantly want to nibble, even if it's unhealthy food. So, yeah. That's really smart. Now I want to ask about finding your fit because you yes. are certified to train in a in hundred different things. I mean, I'm guilty of thinking that whatever works for me is going to work for everyone else, but I get the feeling that you uh, have a different opinion on that. And I, I want to hear like, what does it mean to find your fit? The title of the book, the first book, Finding Your Fit, it really is that idea of thriving in your own lane. And that the the quote unquote best workout, the benefits of a best workout are moot if you can't actually make yourself do it, right? So the benefits of a consistently done sort of mediocre anything is going to be much better than something you never do. Um, Now, that doesn't mean your workouts have to be mediocre. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that I think with fitness, we all get caught in this perfectionist trap of like, well, if I can't do my full CrossFit workout, then I might as well do nothing. Or if I can't, you know, go to the gym for an hour, I might as well do nothing. And I'm a really big believer in something is always better than than nothing. And something allows for a little win that spirals you forward. And with the, the finding of your fit, it's about understanding what works for you. So in the book, I break down four fitness personalities. So the gym bunny, the competitive gym bunny. So that could be, you know, you play a sport or CrossFit would be a, an example of the competitive gym bunny, like somewhere where you need just a little bit of motivation of either competing with yourself or others. So competing in a race, that kind of thing. Then there's the home bunny. And then there's the busy multitasker. And you don't have to be one of those and only one of those, right? So I will say to people who are like gym bunnies and love their gym classes, you know, that's great. But if you get in a really busy time at work and you can't get to the gym, let's say you can't get to your 90 minute yoga class, right? Which then takes half an hour to get to and half an hour to get back, as opposed to saying like, oh, well, I just won't do yoga for the month of, you know, September because I'm really busy. Then you say, no, for the month of September on the weekends, I'll go to my yoga class because I'm less busy then. But during the week, I'll find a yoga YouTube and I'll do it at home. And that goes with the being flexible and 
something is always better than nothing and that your personality can evolve depending on your time of life. So, you know, your personality might be different in your 80s than in your 60s and your 40s, but it also might be different, you know, when you're at a really busy time at work. So you might have to become a busy multitasker, which is the person who sort of peppers exercise into your daily life. So Mm -hmm. take a conference call as you walk around, walk home from work, do fart like intervals, which are sort of unstructured interval trainings as you walk. So, you know, you're walking to get lunch and you see somebody ahead of you in a red shirt and you walk quickly to, to get them. So I think a lot of what derails our motivation to go back to that you know previous question of yours is that we try to make ourselves do things that we hate. And, you know, not that everyone is going to always love all of the exercise they do all the time. There's lots of workouts that I do that I don't love. But there are a few things that I really love. Like I do love to run. So when I don't want to do my strength training and my core work, I'll say to myself, like, you know, if you want to run forever injury free, you have to do these other things. Or my dad's a great example. He's 77 and he plays hockey four days a week and he bikes around uh, Montreal, whereas which he, where he lives, it's very hilly. And, um, you know, he doesn't like doing his balance and strength work and ankle work and all that stuff, but he makes himself do it because he knows if he doesn't, he'll fall on the ice. So, you know, sometimes you have to motivate yourself to do the things you don't love because it's something that you do love. And sometimes it's just enough to find something that you don't hate. And my mom's a great example. It's like I brought her once to one of my spin classes and she got off the bike. My mom's like the most supportive mother in the world. She got off the bike. She looked at me. She looked green, like ill. And she was like, I love you, Kathleen, more than anything on earth. But if you ever try to make me do that class again, I will kill you. Right. And so if I said to her, your fit is doing five spin classes a week, she would never work out. But she loves to garden. She loves to walk. She loves yoga. So that's her fit. So, yeah, it's about thriving in your own lane and not comparing yourself to, you know, what your favorite celebrity does or what your sister does or your brother. Like figure out what works for you and do it. And lastly, to sort of pull on. You had a couple of guests on your show that were talking about passion and I loved that podcast. And they were saying that if you didn't know what your passion was at the beginning, because it's not an instantaneous fit for everybody to at least start with something that you're interested in. And that's what I would say the same thing about fitness. Like, I don't want everybody listening to think like, oh, my Kathleen says I have to love everything I do. That's really unrealistic. I don't love everything I do with fitness. And I definitely didn't love it when I started. But I started with something that I was slightly interested in and that I didn't hate. Right. So I I didn't hate walking on the treadmill, listening to my like Walkman. I think at the time I was probably listening to like Janet Jackson or Paula Abdul or something on my like big ass Walkman. Right. As I walked, And I didn't hate that. But if I tried to start with like a 10K run, I would never have done it. I really like that. Now, do you have a similar policy to nutrition or is nutrition more of a one size fits all? So what I do in my second book is I actually break down, I don't know how many, there's like 10 or 12 different diets and the pros and cons to all of the different diets. And then I connect them to your sort of personality as a human being. So no, I really believe with nutrition, it's about figuring out what works for you, but it's also about figuring out that there's with everything in life, there's pros and cons. So as opposed to trying to find like the perfect diet or the perfect workout, if you can understand who you are, then work to find what sort of works for you. So the second book was actually inspired by my best friend, Emily, and we were sitting having pedicures and she always asks me questions. She's like, what do you think about this diet? Or what do you think about this workout? And I constantly would say, well, the pro of that diet is, is this. And because of what I know about you, I feel that this pro would work, but the con of it is this. And because I have what I know about you, like, I think that that wouldn't work, but why don't you take like this pro from this other thing? And, and anyway, she sort of looked at me, she's like, that's your book. That's your next book. And I was like, what are you talking about? She's like, your next book is that you have to curate your own health, that you have to understand yourself well enough to know the elements that are going to make the biggest difference for you. Um, Mm. Like I'll give you an example because people at home are probably like, what is she talking about? So a great example would be um, if you were somebody who wanted to try some intermittent fasting, like not, I'm not talking about the more, um, extreme on the continuum, like, you know, full day fast, although that's fine too. I'm not denigrating anything. I'm just, my example would be more for people who are thinking about doing like a 12 by 12 or a a 16, eight fast. So 12 by 12 is like where you just have a, like 
you eat from like eight to eight every day, which is uh, pretty much what I do. Or uh, a 16, eight fast is like where you would eat only between 12 PM and eight o'clock. So it's just narrowing your feeding window. So that works really well for people who eat pretty well during the day, but then at night eat you know, thousands of extra calories. And I know a lot of clients like, like that, like during the day, you know, they have salads and chicken and protein. And then, you know, eight o'clock, the TV comes out and the chips and the popcorn and the, you know, the pop. So if you know that you're somebody who can't really control themselves after dinner, something like one of those two types of intermittent fasting might be really great because it's just going to be what I call your biggest bang for your buck. Meaning, it's going to address the issues that are causing you the most damage in your diet, right? And then during your feeding window, you can decide to do eat however you want. Like maybe if you're a vegetarian, you can do that. Or if you want to do paleo, or if you want to do what I call, which is just live by the power of three, which is just always make sure you have um, lots of vegetables, a healthy fat and a protein in everything you eat. But yeah, so that's definitely the second book is all about how to figure out the the nutrition that works for you and how to listen to your body and and how to understand your triggers and fit it for your triggers. Mm -hmm. All right. At this point, I want to pause and take a moment to thank our sponsor, Four Sigmatic, who is making it easy for everyday people to unlock the incredible health benefits of mushrooms. I originally learned about Four Sigmatic when I met their founder at a conference in 2015, and I have been pretty much obsessed with their products ever since. Personally, I use their reishi mushroom tea most nights for an all-natural sleep aid. I carry their chaga immunity blend anytime I travel, and I've also pretty much switched out my usual coffee or yerba mate for their unbelievably awesome mushroom coffee, either in ground or in instant form. Now, what I love about the mushroom coffee is that it combines chaga for immune support with lion's mane for intense focus. And because of that, I actually find it to be more effective than most nootropics or stimulants, including Ritalin, despite having only 40 milligrams of caffeine. It's honestly insane. If you haven't tried out their products, I strongly, strongly recommend you do so. And to encourage you to give them a try, we've actually teamed up with Four Sigmatic to bring you an incredible 15% discount. To take advantage of that, just visit foursigmatic.com slash superhuman today. All right, back to the show. Now, on this show, Kathleen, we really love to give homework. So I wanted to ask you, what is some homework that people can do between this week's episode and next week's episode to improve their health or learn more about themselves, I guess would be even more appropriate. Okay, so I'm going to give you two options. So the first is something that I did uh, maybe 15 years ago. Actually, my therapist got me to do it. I I love my therapist. I've been in therapy for, I don't know, 20 years. One of the things that I didn't say at the beginning when you asked me about myself was that I feel like I'm also not just a recovering perfectionist, but a little bit of a constant in recovery of sort of a depressive, like I was very depressed when I was younger. So therapy and exercise have definitely helped with that. But anyway, my therapist made me create this journal and it's a mood journal. So what I want everybody to do is before they exercise to rate on a scale of one to 10, what their mood is. So let's, you know, one being low, 10 being high. And then I want them to work out and I want them to rate what their mood is after the workout. And this is better over like a two week period, but even a week between episodes is good. And what you're going to notice is that you're always in a better mood post-exercise. And even if you're just in a better mood, like a 0.2 better of a mood, it doesn't have to be a massively big jump, but at least you're fitter and in a better mood, right? Because otherwise you just stay at the same mood and you're unfit. So then you can use this data to help you when you need that self-talk, right? When you need that, Mm -hmm. the motivation. So you can say like, I, I still have this journal for 15 years ago. I don't need to look at it anymore, but I can, when I don't want to work out, I say, Kathleen, like literally the stats show that you are always in a better mood when you move, right? So get your ass off of that sofa. Don't let that sticky chair like pull you down. And even if you just go for a 10 minute walk, like get outside, feel some fresh air, feel some sun on your face. Something is better than nothing. So that's the first one. 
And then the second one would just be some type of food journaling, because I think most of us really underestimate our unhealthy choices and overestimate our healthy choices. So, you know, a client will come in and say to me like, yeah, I only really have a treat once a week. But really when they journal, they see that they have a treat a couple times a day. So journal with awareness brings choice. So just write some stuff down and see what you actually do versus what you think you do. Wow, that's a really good one because I think I probably am guilty of that. Like I think I I don't eat too too much fruit and I, you know, don't eat too much sweets and all that kind of stuff, but I probably indulge more than I should. Yeah. My big one with the journaling was sleep. About six or eight months ago, I have a, a client who's a doctor and I was training him and we were talking about my life and he's kind of looked at me and he's like when do you sleep? And I was like, I don't know. I sleep. I sleep pretty well. And he just looked at me. He's like, you know, Kathleen, not sleeping is like the equivalent of smoking a pack of cigarettes a day for your health. He's like, would you smoke? And I was like, well, of course not. And he's like, well, then you should get more sleep. And I said to him, I was like, oh, don't be ridiculous. His name is Milan. I was like, don't be ridiculous, Milan. Like I sleep tons. So I journaled my sleep for a month. And guess what? I was wrong and he was right. (laughs) I did not sleep tons. I mean, once in a while on the weekend, I would have a really good night's sleep. But on a whole, I was really, really doing damage to myself. So I then decided to make sleep my mission. So I'm much, much better at sleep now. I have much more of a non-negotiable aspect of sleep. I love that. And one of the things I love, I've, I've recently switched from Apple Watch to Aura Ring. And thank you to the folks at Aura Ring. And I love that it gives me sleep recommendations. It actually tells me, you know, did I sleep enough? Did I sleep at the right timing? Was my sleep actually restful sleep? Uh, And it's just been phenomenal. It's really improved my sleep. But lately, I'm like insatiable when it comes to sleep. I'm going to have to look that up because I'm so bad with technology. So I've never used any type of technology to help me with my sleep at all. So maybe that's something to look into. I'm literally, it's amazing that I can turn on a phone. Like I'm 36 going on like 907. Like it's quite funny. Actually, my clients who are, you know, 40 years older than me have better technological skills than I do. I'm like such a Luddite. It's ridiculous. Anyway, that'll be my mission. The next time we chat, you know, if I put out another book in a couple of years and we have another podcast, I will be better at technology. I'm I'm promising you that. I love it. Kathleen, what's uh, one thing you did to feel superhuman today? Well, we've already talked about my run. That definitely makes me feel amazing. But I would say that I love, 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 love times like a million my podcasts, listening to my podcast. I don't have a podcast of my own. But so when I was running, I was listening to NPR, just like the news. And then I started the New York Times, the daily has a daily podcast. But I love, I love your podcast. Now I've become addicted to that. I love Chase Jarvis. I love Tim Ferriss. And I really believe in deciding on who you want to be and how you want to feel and then doing things that make yourself feel that way. And there's nothing that makes me feel more grounded and more positive than listening to a podcast or an audiobook as well. That makes me feel like I feel grounded. I feel like I'm learning. I feel connected to the world. So yeah, you know, if James and I have a fight or something, always what I will say is, you know what, I'm going to go for a walk, I'm going to listen to a podcast for 10 minutes, and then I'll come back and then we'll talk and I always have better perspective. So, you know, I woke up this morning kind of tired, I did my run and listened to my podcast. And I was like, I'm ready to go. I'm excited for the podcast. So, you know, it's that that's definitely, yeah, it's a thing that I love. Very cool. What are some products or services that you couldn't live or work without? So I was thinking about this a lot. I'm going to be very honest. So if I was being superficial, I could say things like my wireless headphones, which James gave me for Christmas, which I love because it allows me to go for walks and chat with my dad and my mom and stay connected because I'm not great on the phone otherwise. But if I'm going to be really honest, I'm going to say that it's a person. Her name is Catherine. And she is my editor, I guess is what I would call her, but she's not my book editor. She's my life editor. So I'm very dyslexic. I grew up um, with huge learning disorder and it was always very hard for me to read. That's a lot of the reasons why I do a lot of audio booking and podcasting because I can learn information listening better. And then I talk about it with clients and that's how I, I learn. Anyway, Catherine is a wonderful, she's a medical editor is her full-time position, but she 
reads my stuff and I will send her a document if I get asked to do like a quote in a magazine, which I do a lot, or if I'm writing an article or even my books before my actual publisher at my publishing house gets my books, yeah. Catherine gets it. And she just reads it through and she makes sure I haven't said there and there incorrectly or, you know, I flip sentences weirdly and she really helps me because I have, I still, I'm getting much more confident as I get older. I'm better and I've, I've been working on it, but she helps me feel that I can do what I do. I can be a writer. And I don't know, she just gives me that little bit of a buffer and confidence and, and I couldn't live without her. Like really, truly, I couldn't live without her. Really cool. Really cool. Way to go, Catherine. So yeah. Tell me, you said you're quite the avid reader and audiobook listener, so I'd love to spend some time going into what are the books that have most changed your life? Oh, Carol Dweck's Growth Mindset is unbelievable. My therapist gave it to me to read as sort of homework. I used to go every week to therapy and now I, I don't. I go sort of once every four to six weeks. So one of the things that she does is she'll give me readings like homework, which I love. Mm -hmm. The growth mindset is what the book is all about. And I just love that it's, you know, everything in life, every experience is just about that challenge and it's about leaning into learning. And, and if you don't know something, you just don't know it yet. If you can't do something, you just can't do it yet. So that word yet is, is really critical in my brain because it's helped me get over um, a lot of my shaming thoughts. So I love that book. And actually just recently, I just finished reading Jane, I think McGonagall is her last name. She wrote this book called Super Better. I first listened to her on the Tim Ferriss show. That review is going to come out on my website. I do these like what I'm reading now book reviews on my website. Anyway, if anybody's listening, Super Better is a really cool kind of fun take on Carol Dweck's growth mindset. Like it doesn't quote Carol Dweck, but as from reading both books, I can tell you that they're very similar, but the super better is, is more fun. So Jane's theory and super better is that we need to all use a, a gameful mindset. So in a game, when you play a game, you opt in and you opt in for challenge. And 80% of the time you're playing a game, you're actually losing, but you don't think of yourself as a loser. You think of yourself as somebody who has just not quite figured out the strategy to win yet right? So it's very similar to the growth mindset in that it's all about leaning into the challenge and finding ways to strategize and acknowledging and seeing where your bad guys are. You know, um, Jane calls like the sticky chair bad guy if you don't want to work out, right? So then if you don't want to work out and you're on the sofa, you can say like, sticky chair bad guy, you're not going to get me. I'm going to fight you. Like you become the hero of your own life in the same way that you do in a growth mindset, which is you become the person who's persevering and leaning into the challenge. So I love both of those books. I really, 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 really love Brené Brown's work mm -hmm. and it's been pivotal in how I look at the world, this difference between guilt and shame. You know, so she talks about guilt being having a problem with an action and shame being connecting that action to you as a person. So with my clients I, and myself, you know, you have a cookie, you don't love the cookie. That's guilt. That's fine. That can be motivating for some people. But if you then think, well, I had a cookie, I, I must be a terribly lazy, slothful person. That's mm. shame. And shaming is so unhelpful and unproductive. So in my book, the, Your Fittest Future Self, the second book, I really talk a lot about Brenny Brown and, and shame and guilt and, and getting a, a productive inner dialogue that is not built, uh, that lets go of, of the shame. And we said earlier, the self-compassion book by Kristen Neff. That's a brilliant book. I love that book. Mm -hmm. I love Derek Sivers, Tony Robbins podcast. I love the Fat Burning Man podcast. The 10% Happier podcast is great. Tim Ferriss is fantastic. Chase Jarvis. Sometimes some of the Oprah stuff can be wonderful. Love it. How much time do you spend listening to audio in a given day? A lot, but it's partly because <laughs> I use it as I do other things. So mm -hmm. like when I'm doing my workouts, I'm listening to my podcast, but it, it's also like if I'm going to a Pilates class and I walk, which is a half an hour walk, I listen to a, a podcast. You know, if I'm going grocery shopping, I'm listening to something. If I'm, wow. you know, going to the bank, like I just, you know, even if I'm only getting 70% of it, like I know sometimes I'm not getting all of it, but if there's something I'm, I'm listening to and I'm like, oh, this is really brilliant. Like, especially on the Audible app, you can bookmark stuff. Mm -hmm. So I will often bookmark things and then just come back and listen to it. And I don't know. I love learning. I love growing. I think that my partner, James, would say that that's both my best and my worst quality. <laughs> he would say that I need to sort of chill out a bit and, and learn to 
appreciate the moment. And but it's hard when you love what you do. And I have a feeling my wife would say the same thing. <laughs> It's hard to be the partner of the person who's like always go, go, going, you know? Yeah. And if you're self-employed, that line between work and life is very blurry. Totally. How do you organize your podcast? Because one of the reasons I don't listen to more podcasts, I, I think that would surprise people, but I don't really listen to podcasts. And it's because I just like, there's so many and I don't know how to organize them and I don't know how to pick which episodes of which shows. And it's like a mess. So what app do you use to organize all your podcasts? So I just, mainly it's that I have a couple podcasts that I always listen to that are sort of my non-negotiables. And then the rest are like, and if I have time or if somebody sends me one, like a good example is the 10% Happier podcast, the Dan Harris one. Mm -hmm. I won't always listen to his. I sometimes don't even look to see if I like stuff. But, but this week, my favorite podcast I listened to was on his show with... I think is Jonathan Harry, I think is his name. I, I'm not pronouncing it right, but it's a guest and he was talking about depression and how to fight depression with connection. And one of my clients sent that to me and then I like loved his interview. So then I, and I loved him so much. So then I Googled other podcasts he'd been on and I listened to him on the Rich Roll podcast and him on the Sam Harris podcast. So sometimes it's just like, you know, like a rabbit hole of podcasts. But mainly what I do is every day, I always listen to the NPR and New York Times. And we have what's called CBC in Canada. That's our like national mm -hmm. news. So I listen to those three, always non-negotiable. And then every week, I never miss Chase Jarvis and Tim Ferriss. And then the other ones I sort of will search through depending on what else I'm listening to. Like if I'm in a really good audiobook, I might not listen to, you know, as many podcasts that week, like, you know, the a super better book that I just finished was like a 20 hour audiobook. So while I was listening to that, I didn't listen to as many podcasts. I don't know. Another great podcast is the Blinkist podcast. So they Blinkist is this app that you can buy that's like synthesizes books in 15 minutes, but they have a free podcast where they interview authors. And that's great. Like if you're wondering if you're going to like a book or not, you can look on that podcast and see if they've interviewed you, that, the author. And with that, then you can sort of see if you might like the book. Awesome. Awesome. Now, Kathleen, I know we have come up on time here, but I do want to give you an opportunity to let people know where they can reach out, learn more and connect with you. So my website's kathleentrotter.com and it has, you know, all of my media stuff on it, all my articles that I've written, but it also has the what I'm reading now section, my newsletter. Um, it also has what I call my pocket of joy section, which I really like. So that's just like, you know, inexpensive products that I have made a really big difference in my life or j just like things like music that I like or podcasts that I like or just silly, silly things. I believe in creating your joy. So if you're looking for things to make you happy, you can look at that on my website. And then I'm really available on the socials. I really, um, I will try to get back to you within, you know, 12 to 24 hours. Uh, K Trotter Fitness on Twitter and Kathleen Trotter Fitness on Instagram and Kathleen Trotter on Facebook. So I'm around. I love it. Love it. And last question I'll ask is if people take away one message from this episode and carry it with them for the rest of their lives, what would you hope for that to be? Do you be you, but be curious in doing and being you because the you that you are now is hopefully not going to be the you that you will be, you know, in five, 10 years. And you're going to change and evolve regardless. You're going to get older. You can't stop that. So you can wake up in five years and you can think, oh, five years has gone by and I'm just sort of a slightly older version of me. Or you can wake up in five years and think, damn, I killed these five years, right? So the time's going to pass regardless. So you might as well do something with it. And the only moment you have control over is now. So if you want yourself to be a fitter, healthier, more productive version of you, you have to figure out how to make the most of this moment. Stop putting off till tomorrow what you can do now. Do something, something small. Just do something. Drink some water, go for a walk, you know, ditch perfection and instead embrace consistency. It's a great note to end on. Kathleen, thanks so much for coming on the show. That's absolutely my pleasure. Thanks for tuning in to the award-winning Superhuman Academy podcast. For more great skills and strategies or for links to any of the resources mentioned in this episode, visit superhuman.blog. While you're at it, please take a moment to share this episode with a friend. 
and leave us a review on iTunes. We'll see you next week.